You're listening to The Dead Prussian, a podcast about war and warfare. I've travelled to Italy. Well, via Skype anyway. I'm trying to understand the idea behind morale. I want to understand what this concept is. Is it as decisive as popular thinking indicates? Is it achieved by shaving every morning? Does a hot cup of coffee improve it? G'day listeners, I'm your host Mick and my guest today is Vanda Wilcox. Vanda graduated from the University of Oxford with a BA in Modern History, a Masters in Historical Research and a PhD in History. Her doctoral thesis focused on morale and discipline in the Italian army during the First World War. She's currently teaching at John Cabot University in Rome. She teaches courses in European and Italian history in the 19th and 20th century, as well as the World Wars. She also teaches on the history of imperialism, memory, and popular culture. And, probably more interestingly, she also teaches modern sports history. G'day, Vanda. Thanks for coming on the show to talk about the concept of morale and Italian forces in the First World War. Hi, thanks very much for inviting me. I'm very excited to be here on what is definitely Australia's number one military history podcast. Um, I'm extra happy because I should be in the gym right now, and instead I'm having a nice chat about morale and a cup of tea. So what could be better? Thank you very much for the call. We are the best Australian podcast. We are near award winning. Uh, The other day I walked past an award. Look, my first question is, uh, I'll be more related to how you end up studying and then teaching European history in Rome. You're at an American university, you're from the UK, and you're teaching European history in Italy. And then you've written a book on morale in the Italian forces in the First World War, which I imagine requires knowing a little bit about Italian, the language, as well as the country, Italy. For those who don't know, Italians come from Italy. So how did you get into the field? And what got you interested in the Italian experience of the First World War? Well, as always with these things, it's a bit of a long story. Uh, The short part is I have an Italian grandma, so I grew up speaking Italian and visiting Italy often in the holidays. Um, But for me, the biggest influence really growing up uh, on my future career was my mother, who had a passion for military history herself. And every summer holidays, we used to go visiting battlefields. We went to the Normandy landings beaches. We went to Waterloo. uh, We went all around Flanders and northern France visiting First World War battlefields. By the time I went to university, I knew that this was what I wanted to look at. So then bringing these two areas together of First World War in particular and Italy, uh, it became clear quite quickly that especially in English, there's not been a lot of studies written about the Italian army in World War I. Uh, and it seemed like uh, a potential space to move into, I guess. And coming over to Rome, doing my research here, working with the Italian army archives, led to me falling in love with the city, and I was lucky enough then to get a job here. That was about 10 years ago, and I've just stayed. It sounds like quite a, uh, a serendipitous uh, way to get into the uh, field and you know trolling through military archives in another language sounds quite fascinating um, but as you said it's almost second nature because you grew up speaking uh, Italian your doctorate as I mentioned was on morale and discipline in the Italian army between 1915 and 1918 in fact you turned this into a book for the Cambridge military history series and we'll plug the book at the end my first question on the actual topic that we're here to discuss, morale, is simple. Can you explain what morale is? Well, I love that you describe that as a simple question because it is one of the most complicated questions, I would say, in all military history. It's one that people have been trying to answer clearly and concisely for centuries. And I would also say that as many people you ask for an answer to that question, you would get that same number of different answers. It's, it's very hard to pin down. We have lots of snappy answers. Uh, for Tolstoy, it was the factor X. Uh, people have described it as the thinking of an army. People have described it as mood or emotion of an army. 
but it's not actually straightforward to come up with a, a definition that always works. I would say it's not the same as the mood or the feeling of the troops because you could be in a great mood because you're about to go home on leave. That doesn't mean that your morale is high. Equally, you can fight very bravely and effectively and be pretty grumpy about it. Again, your mood and your morale in the field don't necessarily match up. Uh, one thing I think that has to be part of a definition that, that really works for military purposes is that it depends on whose viewpoint we're looking at. If we consider a bunch of guys in a mutiny, they could be very committed to their mutiny, they could be feeling strong bond of solidarity between them, um, but from the point of view of the army, their morale, of course, is very low. So morale is directed towards a specific task, and I think we have to have a definition that includes being directed towards the goals that the army, or perhaps the navy or whatever force, wants uh, troops to be performing. So I would go with a, a definition of willingness to perform assigned tasks. Now willingness is not the same as enthusiasm. You don't have to be enthusiastic to have high morale, but you do have to be willing. That could also be in part caused by discipline. It could be highly disciplined troops. But willingness, I would say, is the, is the fundamental context. And willingness to perform tasks that have been assigned to you, whether that is training, whether that is going into battle, whether that is uh, performing garrison duties, it could be a variety of different tasks that are assigned. Um, it doesn't have to be what we think of. We think of morale in combat, but morale also applies to outside of combat scenarios. It applies to potentially long, boring stretches of duty which don't involve actual fighting. So I would, I would go with willingness to perform assigned tasks. It's not very snappy, but I think it works. Yeah, I think that kind of matches with all the uh, fates of a lot of staff officers out there. Uh, you don't have to be enthusiastic. You just have to keep typing on that keyboard. As always, I've tried to ask for a simple explanation and I've got a very complex answer in response. This, I think, is because maybe I'm a bit too simple. I don't understand. But I was kind of looking for something that has a five-step planning process you can assign. There's not a simple policy framework that we can issue to the soldiers. You will now have morale in a order of the day. So if we can't apply a policy framework, if we can't use a five-step planning process to initiate morale amongst the force, how does an army commander harness the power or the effects of morale? Well, you're quite right. If you can come up with a five-step process, the first thing I would say is you've got a stellar career ahead of you because everybody is going to want to know about that process. So if you invent one, brilliant, go right ahead. But in reality, as you say, it's, it's quite difficult. The first reason it's so difficult is that not every factor that influences morale is really under the control of an army. So even with the best one in the world, an army commander can only try to work on those parts of morale which actually can be affected. It seems obvious, but actually a lot of things lie completely outside the control of the army. We can describe sort of external and internal factors that influence morale. So external things that maybe do lie under the control of the army, the quality of leadership or the quality of training, but internal factors that, that troops bring with them, that men and women bring with them into service. So the kind of ideas that people have about military service itself, people's political ideals about war, people's feelings about their country, these are qualities that don't really lie under the control of the army to influence anyway, even with the best will in the world. It's much easier to influence these external factors than to influence those internal factors. So I think the first thing is that we have to know the limits of what we can try to influence and what we can try to work with. Even with external factors that might influence morale, there's a limit to what we can do. The weather, for example, is a classic area that affects people's morale. Um, and again, if you find a way to control that, you're going to be making a lot of money. But until that time, we accept there's not a great deal that we can do about it. What can you do then? You can try to shape or influence how these external factors affect the troops. So you can't control the weather, but you can make sure that your guys have decent weather gear. They have coats and boots that will enable them to survive to the best of their ability. 
the big one is you can't control what the enemy are going to do, but you can ensure that your troops are as well prepared for combat as possible, that they have good equipment, that they've been trained, that they have a realistic understanding of what may happen in battle. So preparation for what they may face, I think, is the, the best way to help influence morale positively from the, from the army's point of view. Um, I, I think also showing that the troops' well-being is important, making an effort. Maybe it doesn't always work. Maybe the rain is so hard that your coat isn't good enough or the training is great but the enemy is better armed. But having displaying clearly to the troops that the army is trying to do everything within its power is also a factor which can strongly promote uh, decent morale. I've divided it in my book into, into four categories. I've said officership or leadership in general, providing positive incentives, that's things like going on leave, good recreation facilities and time off, uh, providing a good disciplinary structure because that's also a part of the story, and then broadly combat readiness and preparation. That's the, the training, the kit, the decent food, all the rest of it that enable men to actually go out and indeed women today into the field and, and do a good job. It's interesting. What I took from that was that I can have a stellar career if I come up with a five-step planning process for morale and somehow learn how to control the weather. Now, because I am both a lover of spaghetti and stereotypes, let's move on to the Italian army in the First World War. I want to know how morale affected the Italian army during the First World War, and I hear you're the person to tell me. Thank you. I, I guess I probably am. Well, the first thing is I can give you a big spoiler for this. Was morale in the Italian army in the First World War any good? Short answer, no. Um, so if you like, we can finish up now and go home. Well, I am home. I record from home, so uh, we might as well just keep going. <laughs> okay. The reason that the Italian army in World War I makes a really interesting case study for morale is that a lot of the studies that have been done on First World War militaries have ended up with conclusions that I think are quite specific to the individual circumstances of that army. So to give you an example, a lot of studies of the British Army have focused on things like the PALS battalions, or they've focused on regiments with a very strong, proud regimental identity, a regimental history and tradition that gives those soldiers a real focus for loyalty, for honour, for comradeship. Now, that's not a very helpful model for morale if we then transfer into an army that doesn't have those traditions or that doesn't have things like the PALS battalions um, that is recruited on a different basis. If we want to try and come up with some more general rules or models for understanding morale, it can be helpful to look at a military that's organized in a very different way. So that's one reason why looking at the Italian army is, is really interesting. The other, of course, is, I suppose, the obvious one. As soon as you tell anyone that you work on Italian military history, all the jokes come out. I've got to say I've heard them all. Um, I'm sure most historians don't immediately get a barrage of jokes about their research topic when they tell people what it is. But if you do Italian military history, you really do. And, um, and also from nations that I do not think have a great military history of their own. You know, it's one thing if it's Australians and Americans, but... When it gets to Austrians coming out with jokes about the Italian army, I have to say, I think it's a bit much. So partly I was interested to see, is this fair? You know, if we actually go and look at what was going on, uh, should we be maybe rehabilitating the impression that we have of the Italian army a bit? Um, after a number of years in the archive, I'm a bit less confident that we can do that. Um, <laughs> what I would say is that there's a huge difference between what's going on at the level of the army authorities and what's going on at the level of actual uh, Italian troops in the field. Reading uh, at an archival level, reading letters and diaries, reading even military tribunal records, they're full of incidents of extreme courage and determination from ordinary Italian soldiers and of incompetence and mismanagement and, frankly, stupidity from people higher up which is a, a relatively familiar story, I guess, to people who've looked at other armies too. So morale in the Italian army is something which is largely ignored for the first part of the war. The first couple of years, 1915, Italy joins the war. 1915-16, they fight a whole series of not very successful battles. 
in the border areas of what is now the border with Slovenia. Nothing very dramatic happens until the big battles of the summer, 1916. But the battle that everybody does tend to know about in the coast of Italy is, of course, the Battle of Caporetto in 1917, October, November 1917, which is a huge and very humiliating defeat for the Italian army. And in the course of that defeat, something like 300,000 Italians are taken prisoner. Another couple of hundred thousand Italians simply chuck their rifles away and head for home into the interior of the country. Uh, one whole army totally disintegrates, basically. Uh, and clearly this is, among other things, a crisis of morale. So this is a, a particular, another particular reason for trying to look at the, uh, the experience of the Italian army through the approach of morale and discipline. It's um, quite astounding, the figures you went through there. Is that 300,000 prisoners taken and, and another army disappearing, a couple hundred thousand just going home? It's a lot. Yeah, and uh, I guess what we need to understand is that the Italian army was experienced in 1915. They'd been to Libya in, what, 1911, 1912, is that right? Just so, yeah. And they weren't a fledgling army like you know, the Australian Imperial Forces. Oh, absolutely. It's a, it's a well-established force. It ha they have conscription, so they have two-year mandatory military service for all at the age of 19. So everyone has had at least some basic training. It, it should have, well, indeed, in the first two years of the war, it fights pretty well. It, it doesn't achieve major victories, but not many people are achieving major victories in 1915, 1916. The Italian army is, is doing okay by most standards. So, yeah, the, the defeat that they suffer at Caporetto in 1917 is a, a big aberration in a sense. And what was the, I guess, we're all looking for the verdict. Yeah, how, how could they have fixed the morale issue in the Italian army? Is it similar to what was plaguing other armies? They just uh, adapted faster uh, in 1917, 1918, or was it uh, something that was systemic within the Italian army? I would say that, a big part of the problem is that the Italian military authorities at the top level do not consider morale to be important. We see plenty of initiatives at brigade level or even at division level in 1915-16 to improve morale. And often they have some quite good ideas, these brigade or divisional level commanders. But there's nothing systemic coming down from Supreme Command. On the contrary, Supreme Command basically thinks that the morale and the the mood and the interests uh, and the views of the troops are completely unimportant. The, the Supreme Commander tends to, see, uh, a guy called Luigi, Luigi Cadorna tends to see his soldiers as basically automatons. He's not interested in how they're thinking or feeling. Uh, all he's interested in is maintaining discipline. The Italian ha army has an incredibly brutal disciplinary regime. They execute the largest number, certainly of any Western European military. Uh, of their own soldiers. They execute 728 soldiers after military tribunals. They also execute another three or 400 in summary executions on the battlefield. So we're talking maybe 12, maybe 1300 men executed uh, by their own forces during the war. So this extremely brutal system is the only way that the army tries to control or shape the morale of its troops. It doesn't, for the first three years of the war, put any interest into positive incentives, providing really good leadership at a junior level, engaging with the troops to explain the purpose of the war, providing any sort of positive motivation. That doesn't happen until the very last year of the war, when after this awful defeat at Caporetto, they finally figure out that actually this is quite important and maybe they want to spend a bit of time and effort looking at it. It's interesting, the tactic on the peninsula, well, it wasn't quite one in ten, but it seems like there's a bit of a hangover from Crassus and the old decimation. To, nothing like that to get your men motivated. We'll move along from morale and discipline in the Italian forces because uh, much like Luigi, and for those listeners out there, he is not uh, Mario's uh, brother, but every guest that comes on the show has to give back to the show in some way. Not because... Their answers to my very simple questions aren't good, but basically because I need a theme for the show, so I ask them this question. Part of our mission on The Dead Prussian is to explore war as a societal construct, as a cultural phenomenon, as a technical endeavour, as a human endeavour. To do this, we try and finish the sentence 
war is, to try and define war the way that Big Carl tried. So, Vanda, I ask you to finish the sentence, war is. Well, the temptation is to say war is a great source of employment for military historians. But I'm not sure (laughs) that's really the very helpful definition that you're looking for. So uh, after thinking about this a little bit, I'm going to go with war is sometimes necessary, always terrible, which means we need to think about it carefully. We need to prepare for it carefully. We need to mitigate its effects on military and civilian personnel alike but we need to prepare for it nonetheless. That's a a very interesting definition. It's very close to two other military historians we've had on the show previously. So it's a very interesting theme that we're starting to see. War is sometimes necessary, always terrible. Uh, That also fits in a tweet, so we can start tweeting about that. Look, Vanda, thank you very much for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure being virtually in Italy with you and having this chat tonight. You do have your book that came out in July, and that is also available where all good books are found. I'm not sponsored by Amazon, but if any of their agents are listening to this, I would love to be. You can find it on Amazon. There's a Kindle edition as well. You can also find it at Cambridge University Press, and it is Morale and the Italian Army, 1915 to 1918, and it's part of the Cambridge Military History Series. So thank you, Vanda. I hope that you enjoy the rest of your nice Italian day. Thank you. All right, listeners, time to give back. Uh, I've given you an episode. You give me some stars on iTunes. More people can listen to us. And then I get an award. No, if you put a review down on iTunes or any of the other podcast distribution networks, what it does is it helps the show get out there and we get more listeners and it helps me find more guests. So jump on Twitter, support us. Jump on Facebook and support us. A big shout out goes to the UK, uh, US and Australian staff colleges, all of them. I have uh, recently heard that there are listeners from all of those, uh, particularly some of the guys just finished up in the US on the SAMS course. If you don't know what the SAMS course is, look it up. There is Google. All right, listeners, until next time, grab a book and crack on. Join the conversation with us on Twitter at Dead Prussian Pod on Facebook at The Dead Prussian page, or on our website, www.thedeadprussian.com. All show notes for this episode, as well as copyright information, can be found on the website. The Dead Prussian podcast is written, produced, and hosted by Mick Cook. It is co-produced by Amanda Levito. The music used throughout is Caught in the Beat by Broke for Free and is used under a Creative Commons Attribution Licence. All opinions expressed by individuals on the podcast are those of the individual and not necessarily representative of any other organisation.